Good afternoon, everybody. Um, a very warm welcome to this particular session of uh, the lecture series, the student lecture series. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing one of my colleagues um, from the film department. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. This, this is actually going to be recorded. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's a great thing to be able to, to look back on. And if anybody's missed that, hopefully we can have those links available to you all. Um, there is going to be an opportunity for uh, you guys to pose any questions via the chat function. Um, so please feel free, as Nigel does his talk, to um, put some questions in that chat section. Um, and then I'll do my very best to have a look at the themes and collate some of those uh, for, a, for a short Q&A session at the end after Nigel's finished his talk. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd just like to introduce Nigel. Um, Nigel Douglas began his career producing and directing for BBC tele Children's Television on iconic programmes including Grange Hill, Blue Peter and Going Live. Specialising in film drama, he went on to direct over 400 hours of network broadcast drama on major series such as This Life, Clocking Off, North Square, Hotel Babylon, The Inspector Lindley Mysteries and Wild at Heart. He has produced drama across all four terrestrial channels and worked on productions globally, including the USA, South Africa, Ghana, Switzerland, France and Thailand. His work has been recognised by BAFTA five times. Nigel's film work includes several short films that have won international awards, including Best Film at the LA Film Festival and Best Screenplay at the New York Film Festival. He has written 11 commissioned feature films and written and directed extensively for national theatre, including the award-winning The Vertical Hour at the Park Theatre. He is chair of the Monaco Film Festival and sits on the BBC Drama Commissioning Panel. Nigel is a senior lecturer at the University of Derby and Oxford Brookes University and a guest professor at the JII Institute in China. So I'm absolutely delighted to be able to now hand over to Nigel for his lecture. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you very much, Chas. Uh, and uh, it's great to see you all. And uh, thank you for making time for me. I'd love to be able to start my talk saying at the beginning of my career, I had a plan uh, and indeed a five year plan or a 10 year plan. Most of my friends who were setting out their lives and sort of entering more conventional occupations seem to have plans for promotion and progression uh, but sadly mine didn't seem to work out that way um, however i was lucky enough um, to be invited onto the bbc uh, tap scheme which is a trainee assistant producer scheme at the beginning of my career um, i'd written um, some plays which had been picked up uh, and identified uh, and unbeknownst to me a producer at the bbc had seen a couple of them uh, and sponsored me to join this training program. So the TAP scheme was um, an amazing opportunity for a young filmmaker. It was a two year training course. Um, and during that time, you spent three months in six BBC departments interspersed with uh, continuous ongoing training in the different facets of television. So I was lucky enough to work on the six o'clock news uh, I worked in various documentary areas. I worked on comedies at the time. Uh, and most exciting to me at the time, I worked on live television. And at the beginning of my career, that was the thing that interested me the most, perhaps the most exciting version of television. Um, however, the producer that had sponsored me and endorsed me onto the course was the producer of a children's storytelling program called Jack and Ori, which probably predates, I suspect, uh, most of you, but I'm sure the staff people will be able to recollect uh, Jack and Ori. Um, it was a very simple format. A well-known person would tell a children's novel over the course of the week, so five 15-minute programmes. Uh, this was back in the day when children's television was part of the main BBC output. Um, so at about 4.30 every day, um, this 15 minute programme would go out and then the story would be told by a well-known uh, celebrity. So uh, I began my working career uh, after I trained on this particular programme. 
the woman that ran Jackanory had started Jackanory in 1965 and had still produced it then. So I began my career in 1988. So she had been producing for two decades this same programme uh, and she was without a doubt utterly terrifying. Um, so I was a very baby, new, fresh, naive uh, director. And my very first day in the gallery of the studio with Victoria Wood um, telling the story, Roald Dahl's Matilda. I sat in the big director's chair, faced with 30 monitors, TV screens, the gallery, I'm sure you've all seen one of those. Um, and I sat there frozen and she gave me probably the best piece of advice anyone's ever given me and holds true to all of our occupations as, as in uh, higher education as well. She leant over very quietly and whispered in my ear, nothing will happen till you speak. And indeed, as soon as I realized that that's what directing was, the more you spoke, the more happened. I was off and running and I introduced myself to the cameras and suddenly cameras started moving and, and that was my first opportunity. So, uh, and it was really the beginning of understanding how multi-camera uh, television worked. So by multi-camera, we're really looking at a studio-based uh, project with five or more uh, cameras. This is how the mainstay of soaps work with multi-cameras, but it's of course the shows that everything from The Voice and Britain's Got Talent through to music shows, etc are all done uh, with multiple cameras. And as a director, you sit in the gallery and you're faced with uh, multiple images on multiple screens and you select different shots accordingly um, in conjunction with the person who sits next to you is called a vision mixer and they physically punch up those shots as you go. So having sort of cut my teeth on Jack and Ori and having been through the BBC multi-camera training, um, the show I really wanted to get onto and work on was a show called Going Live. So this was a Saturday morning live television show, four and a half hours of live television, multiple, multiple cameras, often 10 or more uh, cameras. Uh, and this launched the career of Philip Schofield uh, at the time. So eventually, after much maneuvering, I managed to get onto this program to direct uh, this program and started to learn how to work uh, multiple cameras in a studio but also cameras outside in an outside broadcast environment as well. I think it's worth sort of mentioning at this stage the stage of technology at that time so we are talking at a time pre-internet but we're also talking at a time when we worked entirely on tape um, so there was no digital storage or digital play-in cameras ran directly to a one inch recording tape and any pre-shot films or pre-shot material had been shot on tape and was fed in. So the great technological breakthrough in the year that I, I directed going live was satellite links, which we take for granted now, but this was a very big deal and hideously expensive to achieve. So a program that was incredibly popular at the time was an Australian soap opera called Neighbours. Uh, and after much negotiation, we would finally managed to arrange a satellite link with the Neighbours studio uh, in Melbourne um, and be able to put that on the air for our audience. And uh, I have to say at that time, it was very exciting when the monitors, the pictures picked up into the Neighbours screen and we had two minutes uh, and there was Kylie Minogue and Jason Donovan welcoming our audience and showing us around uh, this uh, particular set and meeting the cast of, of Neighbours. Um, I worked with Kai Minogue some years later on another project and she still claims to remember that day, mostly because I think they'd spent most of the day taking the mickey out of my name because Nigel is about the worst Poms name that you can have and I think they had great pleasure of you know, taking the mickey out of that. Um, so that started to see the technology change and with that the machinery of television uh, started to change. Um, so we got more and more bold and more and more ambitious on going live uh, and that ultimate, ultimately culminated in this massive outside broadcast which uh, I directed which was 
an idea of having a train leave London to Manchester over the course of the programme and it would stop at various stations where different bands would play or different guests would play. So we had 20 cameras on the train. We had 60 cameras at various stations across the way. We had 10 cameras in the studio. So this was a project that we made out of the big studio in, in Television Centre in West London, uh, Studio 8. And at one point we had in the region of 120 images on screen. So uh, it was an incredibly exciting adrenaline filled uh, experience. Um, Going Live was an extraordinary program. It, I know it predates uh, most of you and we don't really do anything like that on any of the main terrestrial channels anymore. Um, but each week it was a magazine show. Each week we'd have guests and, you know, one week you'd find yourself chatting to Madonna. The next week it might be Paul McCartney. The next week it might be Margaret Thatcher. So we would have these big guests and working with those. So it was an exciting time and a very vibrant time for the BBC. Um, and the BBC was getting braver and braver uh, with the projects that it wanted to make. And I was there at a time when it was sort of in expansion. Um, and as I say, we were sort of looking to make new projects all the time. So one of the projects that emerged out of that in doing live television was an attempt to do live drama um, in a particular way. So we created a, a show called What's Your Story? Uh, and the idea behind this show is that we would write and build the sets and the costumes and the actors and so on and so forth for one episode, which was on the Monday. Um, and then for two weeks, the audience would ring in after the show and tell us what happened next in the story. And we would try and do that. So we built a newsroom because we thought that would spark lots of ideas in the audience. So that was our set. And we had a cast of 10 actors. Uh, and we had 12 cameras. So we had this big setup at what was BBC Birmingham, Pebble Mill. Um, and we transmitted on the Monday uh, our story in a newsroom, awaiting the clues that we deliberately put into the script on the Monday for the audience to pick up. Um, however, what we hadn't factored in is that sat behind the editor of the newsroom was a painting that had just come out of the prop room. Nobody had even taken a second glance at it. And it was a picture of a, an old chap who had been a, an Egyptian explorer and he was holding some bits of mosaic that he was investigating. Uh, and this really took the imagination of, of the audience. And in setting the show up, we had pledged um, the uh, idea that we would be true to the audience's suggestion. So uh, overnight, we took down the newsroom, we built uh, Greek and Egyptian temples and baths and bought props up from London. And each day then from that point on, the audience took us in a completely different direction to the way we expected. So that again, that was uh, at a time where the BBC was able to dedicate an entire studio all the crew, et cetera, to a live project. So that was a very exciting uh, time. So I came out of that uh, with a love for drama and realizing that drama actually was my natural home as it had been at the beginning. I started, as I say, writing for theater, which was always, I think, my rough plan of what I might do uh, for a living. Um, so I liked the idea of performance and I was very interested and still am in the nature of performance and how you uh, direct performance. Um, so this process led me to wanting to make film. So that was the beginning of my time then thinking about making film. But again, I want to sort of draw your attention to a time prior to digital technology. So to make a film, you literally had to make it on film. Um, so at that time, we were very poor, um, not really earning very much, couldn't really raise very much money to make film. So I spent my weekend sat in reception at Kodak, um, begging and borrowing bits of film which called short ends, the ends of film that nobody wanted anymore. Um, and I would take all those home in a big bag and make my bedroom very, very dark. And then I would cut together all these bits of film till eventually I built up enough stock to be able to go and make my short film. Um, and that was the first sort of film that really launched me into the world of 
film and started, I suppose, my profile in festivals uh, and in the bigger picture. So uh, at that time then, so having done some short films and this other drama, the and I was still in children's television at that time, full time, um, although being freelance because there were no staff positions or still aren't any staff positions. So it was a freelance life. I decided it was time uh, to try and get into drama. So the drama to get into in children's was a children's drama called Grange Hill, which was very important at the time. Um, and that was really an opportunity there to cut your teeth in drama and to begin to understand about uh, the language of film and how the language of shots connecting to each other, uh, you're able as a director to manipulate and uh, influence an audience's perception to how things work. So I was lucky enough at Grange Hill to get the opportunity to make a, a special version of Grange Hill, which uh, was to be shot in Poland. Um, and it was really the story of uh, our kids from Grange Hill entering a European um, singing contest. So we took our cast to Poland um, and had this really interesting uh, script uh, mixed with children from all over Europe and particularly from the Eastern Bloc and these amazing choirs. Um, and so we developed a script around that. So I wrote quite a lot of that. Uh, and then we were delighted when we got back that that was nominated and then won uh, Best Children's Drama at BAFTA. So this was the first time really, I think, you know, in, a, in this kind of industry where I became maybe more visible um, as a director, um, having uh, had this BAFTA nomination uh, and victory. Uh, and that was the time then where I was starting to uh examine what areas uh, i could go to and the natural progression from grange hill was to east enders so east enders at that time was just twice a week it was a, a less of a, a sort of machine than it is now um but was at the same studios so grange hill was shot at the elstree studios in north london um and so was east enders so I managed to get onto uh, a block of EastEnders. Now, most directors work in television, shoot a, a certain period of television. So as a drama director, you'd shoot two or three episodes at a time. So there'd be directors before you and directors after you. Um, so I managed to get a block on uh, EastEnders, which again was a sort of another terrifying uh, moment of suddenly being faced with these very famous people and having to learn to direct and be confident enough to, to engage with them. I was incredibly lucky that the producer of, of that block that gave me the opportunity was a woman called Jane Fallon, who is now a sort of very famous author uh, and uh, is the wife of Ricky Gervais. Um, and she was a sort of up and coming uh, producer at the time. And she had developed this show called This Life, um, which was this sort of almost realistic, dramatic uh, story of four lawyers living in a house, um, but really dealing with the sort of rave and drug culture of the um, mid 90s. Um, so I went from EastEnders to direct This Life. Um, the The sort of idea around this life was in a way stylistically we borrowed from the sort of great American shows at the time so like New York uh, NYPD Blues and and Homicide so we developed an entirely new shooting style which was to make drama feel that it was real rather than dramatic rather than acted um, so after being absolutely hammered by the critics when we went out uh, and everybody hating it um, it then went on to win BAFTA, so uh, I then won BAFTA for Best Director and I also won BAFTA for Best Drama. Um, and then suddenly, of course, everybody absolutely loved the show and it's since become considered to be the most iconic show of, of the 90s. So that really, really launched my career into a bigger world now. Um, and 
for the first time now, I was approached by uh, big agents and I was starting to have meetings for bigger end work. And that really allowed me to move into film uh, more. So I'd continued writing at this time. So I'd always been writing. But now with the advantage of an agent and with some profile, I was able to now get meetings with my uh, with producers and I was managed to start selling some scripts. Um, and that really started to change my career and my perception of my career. So my plan really was to continue writing and arrive at a place where I could write and direct, which is, of course, a dream for all uh, writers and directors. Um, so that was sort of a year of, of suddenly having things commissioned and it being very exciting. And then the slow realization that, in fact, only 3% of scripts that get written uh, in the UK uh, ever get to production. So most scripts get commissioned and they get paid for and then they get put on a shelf. Um, and I was sort of now in my late 20s and beginning to understand the sort of the brutality of the film industry as I discovered that a lot of scripts get commissioned simply to stop somebody else having that idea or using that idea. But nonetheless, I then began to consider myself as a writer. So the other aspect that this life enabled me was to begin to work uh, in a second unit way on big feature films. So my first outing was on the first Mission Impossible film, um, where I started doing some stunt work and learning about stunt work. And I started directing some second unit stunt work um, which at that point involved flying a helicopter down a tunnel. Um, so I, I worked on that and enjoyed that and, and had some amazing experiences for the weeks that I spent on that, which I guess culminated in, in go-karting one evening uh, and finding myself racing around a go-kart track with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, um, which was a pretty weird evening, uh, mostly because, of course, you're not allowed to win. So... Uh, Myself and the crew were all driving very, very slowly behind uh, Nicole and Tom to make sure that they won every race. Um, but I guess since he was paying, that seems fair enough. Um, so that really took me through uh, the 90s uh, and keeping busy. And I, I increasingly then was getting involved in big stunt set pieces. So I was working on shows like Casualty, um, which have enormous... Uh, big stunt set pieces and and one of those uh programs then um was the christmas day program which was uh the first million pound episode of casualty which had 38 consecutive stunts all at night um so that was a massive massive undertaking and the success of that then led to me going to work on london's burning which again is a show that probably predates you but this was a major ITV Sunday night uh, drama that centered around a London fire station. Um, and I think probably the period, the two or three years that I spent doing this show were really sort of identified by the madness of what television is. So on London's Burning, our process would be write a script. In this script, we're going to burn down a pub. So in week one, we would build a pub in a studio, an entire, entire interior of a pub and then in week two we'd burn it to the ground and then on the following monday we'd burn that we'd build the next set so we'd build a cafe and then the next week after that we'd burn it to the ground so for weeks upon weeks we would spend hundreds of thousands of pounds building sets and then we would set fire to them um so it's a kind of crazy bizarre world um so, yes, yeah, so that led to me then doing more stunt work. Um, and during that time, I worked uh, a little bit on uh, Braveheart as well in Ireland uh, with Mel Gibson, uh, doing some fight sequences, uh, which was quite interesting. Uh, and then that began to sort of open up a more global uh, environment. So I then was asked to go to Thailand and I worked on a film called Mortal Kombat, doing some fight sequences. Um, and then as I started to travel, I sort of got involved uh, in various of my own films then. So then I did a, 
a feature film called The Knock, uh, which we shot in Ghana. Um, and that was a kind of interesting uh, time working in a, a nation uh, such as that, which had limited resources and a limited film industry. Um, and a sort of suspicion still, I think, of Western uh, film crews. So when we were doing our first recce in Ghana, so our first look at what we might shoot there. Uh, so I went to Ghana with my producer. We were there for about two weeks. And, and one afternoon we were filming just uh, on a little uh, mini camera. Uh, we were stood on top of a sort of edge of a, a rocky outcrop looking down on a little fishing village. Uh, and we were thinking that would make a good location uh, for uh, one of the scenes that we had to shoot in Ghana. Uh, unbeknownst to us, of course, at the time, is that the next bay along was uh, a naval base, a Ghana naval base. So as we're filming then, <clears throat> a black van turned up behind us and six soldiers jumped out and we were arrested at gunpoint for military espionage. Uh, and myself and the producer banged up in a military prison. Um, and whilst they stripped the camera out and uh, proved that we had indeed been filming the naval base, we honestly couldn't even see it was there. There were no ships in the naval base. Um, but it took three days for us to finally get uh, a release from the president of Ghana um, and get back out again, uh, by which time my poor producer was in shreds. Um, so it sort of has some quite exciting uh, moments. So that led at the turn of the century at uh, 1999. Um, I got an approach to set up a brand new TV series, um, which was to be a new medical series um, set in a heart uh, environment, set in a heart wing hospital. Um, and this went on to become Holby City. Um, so I spent six months going to pretty much every heart operation at Hatfield Hospital and studying how it was done, spending hours watching surgeons do it, and then scratching my head, working out how we could do massively complex heart surgery in the space of a BBC one hour drama. And also where we could learn how to fake medicine at that particular level. We'd done obviously quite a lot of fake medicine on casualty and we understood the basics of, of prosthetics and how we could arrive at that. But the complexity of now doing heart surgery and creating whole cavities uh, with hearts and lungs, etc., was was a new area for us and a new another curve of learning for me. Um, so we began to set that up and then that started working and that was great. Um, and that was very exciting. One of the shows that I had been desperate to try and get onto <clears throat> and had pestered the producer uh, for several years was this, uh, a drama series at the time called Soldier Soldier, which was a fairly self-evidently a drama series about um, squaddies and their wives, uh, which came out of Nottingham and came out of your part of the world. Um, uh, and I was very keen to direct that. It had a lot of stunt sequences. It was quite ambitious and it was quite an interesting project, but I, I couldn't get onto it. But the producer remembered me and my pestering and offered me the opportunity to make a new brand new drama series called Making Waves, which was soldier soldier, but with the Navy. Uh, and for obvious reasons, didn't call it Sailor Sailor. Um, so this was an amazing opportunity uh, in conjunction with the Navy. So the Navy gave us a fully operational, fully armoured frigate for three months to go and do whatever we what we wanted. It gave us fast jets and submarines and aircraft carriers and everything that we could possibly dream of to make this massively ambitious uh, ITV drama series. Um, and it was the first ITV drama series to cross the £10 million mark, which at that time was a considerable amount of money for uh, six uh, ITV hours. Um, but again, it was an amazing experience to be on a fighting ship. Um, obviously, in order to film on the ship, we basically threw half the crew off on a Monday morning and put my crew on. And then we went to sea and we'd go to sea for two weeks. Um, and film solidly for those two weeks and then come back. So it was again a really interested, uh, interesting time. 
So I think, you know, that at that point, it's quite interesting to look at how film crews work, really. So that crew to shoot that show was incredibly small. So it was about 30 people. But the average uh, television drama and film crew is around 100 people. And even that is relatively small. So um, I did a little bit of work uh, the year before last on uh, Star Wars 9, so the latest Star Wars, J.J. Abraham's Star Wars film. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And that had a crew of three and a half thousand. So films now have expanded uh, in the size of the amount of people and their ambition and, of course, inherently, therefore, their cost. Um, I think very often people think of filming uh, at the professional level as being an entirely sort of artistic or aesthetic process. Um, but in many ways, it's also a sort of scientific and an engineering based process. Mostly we're problem solving all the time of how we can put equipment in certain places, how we can achieve certain shots, how we can build certain ideal situations with which to work in. So um, that becomes quite an interesting process of, of how you build a crew who have those specialist skills in order to be able to do that. So around about this time, the world started to change for television uh, irreversibly. So we began to see, well, the first advent we called non-linear editing, which is what we understand now is digital editing. And now suddenly we could edit very fast. We could edit as we were going along. Before that time, as I mentioned, we would film on tape and we would have to copy one tape to another tape in order to make an edit. Now suddenly we could digitally store material and we were at the beginning now of the boom in CGI. So we'd always been able to use green screens in a very basic and not very pretty way. But the advent of digital technology allowed us now to begin to think about how we would use computers uh, to be part of the image and to be part of the understanding of the image and the process. And that then led to a new wave of programming and new ideas. So the first time I really tried this out um, was on a program called Hotel Babylon, which is a BBC uh, program um, set in a hotel, but very, very stylized. And for the first time, we started using digital effects on the show. Um, we started being able to explode people and to freeze people. And we started exploring the idea of motion control um, so in television, we were a bit slow to catch up, really, because film had already started this process, but it was partly a, a budget uh, thing. So Hotel Babylon was very successful uh, and got nominated for lots of awards. Um, and at that point, uh, I was incredibly busy, being given lots of offers. Uh, and they say, do they not, never work with children and animals. Um, and at that time, I, for some explicable reason, ended up doing both. So I got offered the opportunity to set up a new BBC, a new ITV series called Wild at Heart, which some of you may remember, which was a, a TV series um, about a vet who moved from England with his wife. So the vet, played by Stephen Tompkinson and his wife, Amanda Holden, uh, moving to uh, a game reserve in South Africa. So South Africa then proved to be a very interesting experience. So South Africa didn't really have a television industry in, in drama terms. It had a commercials industry and it had some crew and some infrastructure. But on the whole, it didn't really have very much structure there. So we began uh, finding a game reserve that we could work on. We began the process of building the, the house and the, the vet surgery on this game reserve, which were both sets. Um, and we began searching for crew. Very often, um, the process uh, of us taking over an area, invading an area as a film crew is quite intrusive. And I think probably none more so than this project uh, where we were in a game reserve, but surrounded by townships and we were looking to use as much local labor as we possibly could. This in itself caused a lot of controversy because we were prepared to pay a much higher rate than the local labor in the townships we're used to earning on the farms, et cetera. 
So we had a lot of political negotiations to do. And this culminated in us building schools uh, in the townships and building community programs in the townships and something that I uh, still go back and am involved in now and something I'm very proud of um, that we were able to build a, a legacy there. So Wild at Heart inherently was about a vet dealing with wild animals. So here was another brand new experience of how you film with wild animals. So these animals were not trained. Um, they lived out on an 80,000 acre game reserve. So we had to find people that could work with these animals and be able to bring the animals to us when we could, or we had to go and try and find them. So we had a fairly successful first season of Wild at Heart, working with the animals that we had, which were zebras and giraffes and elephants and lions, and it was all very exciting. And we set ourselves a rule that we wouldn't use any CGI, that we would be entirely dependent on the reality of what we could film. Back in London, in their cosy offices in central London, the executive producers and writers of the show were desperate that we did a story with hippopotamus. Um, and it is almost impossible to get near a hippopotamus. As you probably know, hippopotamus kill more human beings than any other animal. They are terrifyingly huge um, and you simply can't get them to do what you want them to do. But we had got word that a baby hippopotamus uh, three or four years prior to this had washed up still with the placenta attached uh, on an ex-game ranger's land high up in the Northern Territories of South Africa. So we flew up uh, to meet this um, uh, game ranger and see if we might be able to film with this hippopotamus. So we arrived uh, after much travel at this uh, house in the middle of absolutely nowhere, thousands of acres away from anywhere. When we arrived, we were met by around 30 growling, barking bulldogs who clearly were there to scare off any visitors. Eventually, a guy came out and cleared the dogs away. We went and met the game ranger um, and said, OK, let's go meet the hippo. So he walked with us down to the river. Uh, on the way down, I mentioned, I said, you've got an awful lot of dogs. He said, well, they're to keep the visitors out. I said, but we've got less now than we used to have because of the crocodiles in the river. So. This is a story where I plan to put an 11 year old boy in the river with the hippopotamus. So I look at my producer and my South African line producer and assume that this can't happen. But as we get closer to the river, he said, but the crocs aren't really a problem anymore because there are two leopards in the forest and they're scaring the crocs away. So that was that. We thought, well, we're never going to be able to do this. But we meet the hippo and it comes out of the river and lies at our feet and takes a drink from us and we pet it and it rolls over and you can tickle its tummy. And so it's too good an opportunity to miss. So uh, after much negotiation and more health and safety paperwork than you can possibly believe, we finally managed to film with the boy and the hippopotamus in the river. But it is the only job I have ever done in my life where 10 people stood behind camera with loaded rifles pointing at the hippopotamus. And as I turned the camera over and we started to film, all you could hear was click, 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 click of all the safety catches coming off the, uh, the, uh, the rifles. So it was a pretty uh, terrifying uh, time. So just, I think my time's already starting to run out, but just to sort of uh, round up then, um, it sounds kind of a very exciting and it has been a very exciting life and I've managed to travel to amazing places and meet amazing people. But I really just want to put that into context of uh, it's an occupation that requires incredible dedication and commitment and sacrifice, incredibly long working hours. Uh, as a director, I would start work at between 6 and 6.30 every morning and finish 10 or 11 at night and that would be six days a week. Um, most filming is taking place outside where it's either freezing cold or boiling hot. Um, you're always away from home. So it is complicated and, and indeed uh, demanding. And it's a very difficult industry to get into. And it's an even more difficult industry to stay in if uh, simply because of the demands of the work more than anything else. We're facing a big change 
now in television. Um, television historically has always been the poor cousin of film. Uh, partly that's a budget process. Um, but the advent of Netflix and Amazon and now Disney uh, have changed the face of television. And now television drama is ahead of film in, in most people's thoughts. Uh, and this has been multiplied, of course, by the pandemic since you know, loads and loads of people now have bought Netflix or Amazon where historically they might not have done. And now the big film studios are being forced to put their films onto these platforms too. So in the last <coughs> two years, everything has changed. And with it, the budgets that go with television. So uh, almost all the way through my career, even the biggest budget, and I've worked on some of the biggest budget shows of all, um, you're talking maybe about a million or a million and a half per one hour of television. The show that I have just recently been working on in the last couple of months, which is the new Star Wars TV series, has a budget of 375 million for 10 40 minute shows. So we're now looking at budgets of 15 or 20 million uh, per episode of television. Um, and this will change the game completely. Um, and we can all blame Game of Thrones for that. Um, so uh, that's me probably rounding up. That was a sort of whistle stop tour through my career. I hope some of it was interesting um, and a few sort of interesting stories. And yeah, Chaz, back over to you. Nigel, Nigel, thank, thank you so, you so much. much. Um, what a what fascinating, fascinating insight into, into um, um, you know, you know, your career in film and TV. TV. Um, and some, and some amazing stories. stories. Uh, and, for and for me personally, there's this kind, of, kind a of a potted, potted history of TV from, from late middle, middle to late 70s, 70s onwards. Uh, well, and and well, it, well, when well, you look at it, it's it's been really, really fascinating, fascinating to listen to that. To that. Um, there's, um, been, there's been a few questions, questions come in, but I'm going to I'm going to ask a question that I had jotted down at the very beginning was that did you always want to get into sort of film and TV and or was there something that triggered that? Was there something you watched or you heard or you read or something that really made you have that decision? Um, yes and no. So when I was in the sixth form, I entered quite a lot of writing competitions um, and indeed won quite a lot of writing competitions, uh, one of which was a big national writing competition, which had this amazing prize of a six week trip around Europe, all expenses paid for you and your family. Um, and I think, you know, my teachers at the time, I was absolutely lousy at physics and chemistry and biology. And so my sort of sixth form teachers were going, you need to write, really, you should pursue this. And I think probably early on, I saw that in a prose based idea. So I maybe try and write novels. Um, but I got entirely seduced by theatre and I went to theatre quite a lot and um, and that really set me off thinking I'd really like to write for theatre and I, as I said at the beginning I didn't really have a plan um, very much and, and and much to my father's chagrin I didn't really know where this would go so um, I would say if I was honest mostly it took me rather than I took it. Great, and it's interesting. That, that ties in wonderfully to the first question that came up on the chat was um, about if you could just l let us know a little bit more about the first plays that you wrote um, and what interested you particularly about the live format. Uh, yeah, OK. Well, they're two sort of different questions, really. So the first, uh, the very first play I uh, ever wrote was called The Swimming Party, um, and it was a sort of futuristic play that examined the idea of if we could remove men from social existence and have a female-based society, then we would probably stop war. We wouldn't need as many police. Um, we wouldn't have as much hypocrisy and conflict. And and therefore, it was so it was a play about women being able to hire out men um, to use as they want. Um, the second play uh, uh, I wrote was called Tonight's Night, and that was about a um, group of sixth formers who seek to get, who have left and gone to university, who regroup to get revenge on a particular teacher who sort of bullied them. Um, and it was really a, a, an investigation of, of the nature of authority in education, uh, little did I know. Um, so, uh, so that was, yes, where that, that sort of started and that really got me going. What was the second part? Live 
directing live stuff. What, what particularly interested you about that that whole kind of live format? Oh, it, it's just it's the closest you can get, I think, to being a performer in some ways to get that adrenaline buzz. Um, you know, I think particularly at the BBC when we were live on Saturday mornings, we had the whole network on our desk, so we were transmitting BBC One in front of me. You know, I literally could press one button and stop BBC from transmitting. So. Um, but I think you know it's so fast moving and intellectually challenging when you're looking at 30 or 40 different images and selecting from them, as well as queuing tapes to be played in, graphics to be played in, colour changes, et cetera, et cetera, and talking to your uh, artists on microphones all at the same time. It's a very all-consuming uh, process. It's almost the opposite to drama, which is much more detailed and much more focused and considered. Mm. Just, just picking up on that, is there a, a kind of worst moment for you on live TV? Did, did it happen? Could you recall it? Or yeah, I had quite a few pretty dodgy moments, really, where I picked wrong cameras or wrong ideas. Um, but mostly they were generated by very mischievous. Uh, presenters. So Philip Schofield used to think it was hilarious to, to wrongly count me into films that were being played in. So the only bits we would write would, would be the last sentence. So when the presenter said the last sentence, back in those days of tape, you had to allow five seconds for the tape to get up and running. Um, so that sentence would be five seconds. And when they started that sentence, you run the tape so that when they finished their sentence, the tape would then come up on the screen. So he would often start the sentence and then he would stop the sentence halfway through. So my tape is running and then he would then carry on with the sentence. Then I was spooling back on the tape and then the tape spooling would go out on the air. And so we had a few of those. We had a few pop groups swearing and various other bits and pieces, but but luckily I got through it. <laughs> the joys of live TV. Yeah, I imagine. Brilliant. So another question that came in, um, which is a really good question is, um, Tricky one probably to answer, but uh, do you have any tips and advice for people applying for trainee schemes and entry level roles this year and wanting to work in drama? The the, the training nature of, of television has changed completely. I mean, BBC don't even run a trainee assistant producer scheme in the same way that they used to because it requires investment and there's, there's no money. Um, I think increasingly now, there's an expectation that people will train on the job, will enter at sort of runner level and train on the job. Um, BBC does still train in some of the te more technical areas, um, but I think skill set and uh, BFI all run incredibly good training uh, areas now. But but ultimately, I think if you want to work in film, you need to get a, a, a good degree in in film that gives you good technical expertise. I think that's that's a considered way in now. You know, when I started training, there was only the National Film School. There were no other film schools and there were no film degrees. You couldn't go and study it, you know. So BBC and ITV were really the only places you could learn. Mm, interesting. And a little bit allied to that, Nigel. Um, another question that came in was, do you have any advice for potential screenplay slash script writers? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, come and do my course. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, basically the industry wants to say no. So the film industry runs a culture of fear. Who can anybody, how can anybody know what makes a great screenplay at the end of the day? You know, if, if you knew how to write a great screenplay or identify a great screenplay, we'd be billionaires, wouldn't we? And I think if you look at the last hundred years of film for all of us, even experts in film, can probably only name two or three hundred great films. So we know it's a sort of really difficult area so really to get going as a writer now you have to well we all quite get a bit of heat so in in really you should be looking at other areas of writing first so writing for theater writing for radio uh writing commercials is a really good way of building a portfolio that people can understand um the submission of screenplays is is massive so so the bbc now when I started on the panel there, we would get maybe 10,000 screenplays a year. Now we get upwards of 50,000 screenplays a year. When I first started on the film the film festival, we'd get maybe 300 short films submitted for six places. 
Last year, we had 36,000 short films submitted. So technology has changed and, and the industry has changed. Mm. And immensely challenging, isn't it? I think it always has been in, in, in a way, hasn't it? But yeah, It has, yeah. I mean, it, but I think the important thing is it's pro rata. You know, whilst there were very few then, there was very few outlets to make then. There were four terrestrial channels. You know, now there's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of channels and outlets. So there's definitely considerably more opportunity now, but there are many more people trying to get into that opportunity now. Mm. Interesting, yeah. I won't um, take you back to Grange Hill. I remember it pretty well. Um, and it was a it was a programme that was obviously based for young people, but mm. had some pretty major themes attached to it, didn't it? Um, mm. Themes that probably had never been, you know, kind of uh, thought about for a young audience before. Mm. And obviously Phil Redmond was kind of part of that whole kind of scene and did you have much of a relationship with Phil Redmond and those? No, those... absolutely. Yeah, those... Phil, Phil was all over it really. I mean, he, he to this day retains the copyright on all the characters for Grange Hill mm -hmm. um, and it was sort of very much his voice really, I think, Grange Hill. Um, I guess like many shows, you know, they probably you couldn't make it now. We live in a much more sensitive culturally and, and, and morally sensitive time now than we did then. But certainly in my time there, I dealt with abortions and drug addictions and alcoholism and abusive parents and bullying and, yeah, quite full on uh, ideas, given this was a programme that went out at five o'clock in the weekdays. You know, it's, yeah. um, it was very brave programming. Mm -hmm. Did they, How did it go down with, with critics and, and, and those sorts of people? Did it, because it was so kind of revolutionary, did it have a, a kind of it, on the radar for that? In the adult world, it polarised people completely. I think there were a lot of parents who continuously complained about subjecting their poor young darlings to this sort of slightly realistic environment. And, and that was reflected with the critics as well. I think, you know, the Daily Mail and the Telegraph were endlessly criticising, um, you know, but, but then, you know, everybody loved Grange Hill. It's one of those shows that I think defied the critics in a way. Mm, interesting. Another question just literally just popped in. Um, would you say that the British film and TV industry is far less likely to take risks on new writers due to the financial climate? Due to any climate. Um, it, it is the sort of absolute catch-22, really. You know, to get going as a writer, you need to have got going. So to be commissioned, but very, very few projects are commissioned from brand new voices and new writers. What often happens is a new script or a new voice, the idea will be bought and then the producers will go to existing established writers and get them to write that uh, particular project. Um, and of course, that sort of comes back to what I was saying previously. If, if you can write a small play and get people to see the play, then producers can see that you write and weirdly you skip that system and suddenly you become an established writer and they're, they, they're confident that you can write you know the, the project um screenplay writing and television writing is is infinitely more complex than, than than most people give it credit for and has so many rules and determinants that um you know very few people actually become very expertise at, at writing screenplays which is why you know writers are the most sought after of all the trades in, in the film and television industry um but still probably the hardest area to break through mm -hmm. yeah conscious time but um yeah i love, I love the mission impossible story um <laughs> I could just visualise Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman and yourself, you know, yeah, what a going out, going yeah. out forever. Um, but for me, it was topped by your Wild at Heart story. <laughs> That's a good story. Your, your baby uh, hippo and, and yeah. things like that. And I, I did put a little question together for myself. That that must have been quite an adventure for for not just you, but the whole crew in in kind of going out there and making that kind of TV. Yeah, it it, it was it was much more complex than any of us had really, I think, thought about. I, I think we have ideas in the in, in Britain of what we think apartheid was and is and how that functions, but to actually be immersed in that as a British production company, you know, because I, I was there six months at a time um, for two years, and so you're very kind of living with this still quite significant split between uh, sort of black population and the white population. So. 
uh, and then having having them work within that uh, system, you know, it took me two months to get my assistant to stop calling me sir. You know, and, and when I imagine when I finally got him, he I was a, this guy that I was absolutely loved. You know, was fantastic at his job and and got everything right. But when I finally got him to stop calling me sir and start calling me as Nigel, some of his other work colleagues from the local township where he'd come from would come up to me and say, "Is it possible he can call you sir when other people are around? Because otherwise, people think he's being disrespectful." You know, and that's that simple idea is absolutely inconceivable in in britain as a, as a concept but but mm. so there's a lot to learn about how to do that not least also a lot to learn about how you work with wild animals <laughs> of course yeah at least yeah um so wrapping this up really in the final kind of mm. few minutes nigel is there a today is there a kind of favorite production that you've been involved with that you kind of just go yeah that was the one that that i really thought i did well or really enjoyed the most making uh, yeah I think it's interesting, isn't it, that, that generally the shows that do very well that you're most proud of were the show, shows that were pretty hideous to actually make. Um, so I did a show that that I really, really loved uh, in 2000 called North Square, which was uh, with Helen McCrory, who sadly has just died this week, um, and Phil Davis and Rupert Henry Jones and Kevin Kidd, all these great, great actors, um, which was brilliantly written and and great cast and everything else the channel four drama series um but was a pretty hideous time for me making it and then other shows like the naval show for example which was just fantastic fun i mean it was just a you know every person's dream to have this enormous toolkit to do whatever you want with um was great fun and it was a terrible terrible drama series <laughs> <laughs> can't win them all as they say that's a shame brilliant um so my last question to you is who was your favorite blue peter presenter Nigel? ah uh, well i was uh, julia uh gosh just complete janet janet ellis was my sort of period and peter duncan and those. so i was very fond of janet uh, she was a very nice woman um but Blupita also, like Jack and Uri, was run uh, by an utterly terrifying woman. And uh, and she would change the script literally three minutes before we would go on air. And you would spend the whole, because Blupita was live, every episode trying to catch up with what was going on. And everybody was shouting. And it was, it was one of those shows that had this sort of childlike calm and innocence on screen. And this just... The air was blue in the gallery. <laughs> yeah. Fabulous. It never came across as that. But no. <laughs> you must have done an amazing job. Yeah, fabulous. Thank you. Right. Um, Nigel, thank you so much. It's been no, a, a real pleasure to, to you. listen to um, such, such a great sort of career in, in film. I don't know if there's anybody there, Chaz. Is there, has anybody been listening? <laughs> I hope so. I don't know. But there's been some questions, so they look okay. really intimate to me. Um, so, yeah, so thank you very much indeed. And I'll wrap that up for Nigel for now. Um, so that just leaves me to just say that thank you, whoever mm -hmm. out there, um, listening and watching to this. Um, and like I said before, this is part of a series of student lectures. Um, and the next one is going to be on Monday, uh, April the 26th, which is next Monday. Um, and that's going to be with a gentleman um, who is the host of the World's Toughest Prisons um, series, so Raphael Rowe. Um, it's free, but you will need to book uh, tickets for it. So if you're interested in that next um, lecture, then please feel free to sign up. OK, that's it from me. Have a great rest of the day, everybody. And thanks again, Nigel, for your amazing input and amazing stories. Thanks Thank very you. much. Thank you.